Let's read from 1 Timothy chapter 3. Please locate in your Bibles 1 Timothy chapter 3. This was originally intended to be the final sermon in our series, but uh, the the reality is as we dig deeper into um, this important subject, there are a few things that I believe we need to round out over the coming weeks, which we will be doing. However, it is the final message in this series from this particular text. So we're going to read the whole text so that you get the context, and as we get the context, we'll I trust, um, better be able to appreciate the content and all that it means for our lives today. Let's read uh, from 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife... Sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. And with that entire passage read, let's read just verse 7 together. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Amen. Why do you bother with people who are not members of your church? I've been asked that a few times. Why why do you get involved in these complicated situations in the community? Why do you engage local action groups like the residence associations and the neighborhood watches and the police ward panels and things like that? Why why did you spend so much time looking after the elderly gentleman who used to live at the corner? Hadn't he basically made his choice? Didn't he push people away through his life? Shouldn't he have just faced the consequences and you got on with your life and maybe you could have used that time with someone else? Or more recently, um, several times uh, asked about the, uh, the lady that I've shared with you uh, more recently about she has a type, a very rare type of dementia And I've been looking after her in various ways. I should say we have been looking after her in various ways via the food bank for four years, since 2020. Um, Her condition has continued to deteriorate mentally and physically and all of that. And um, uh, she she was an interesting person and she has become an increasingly difficult person. Now she's sectioned. And who has responsibility? I do. I I have power of attorney. I'm her next of kin. She has occasionally attended here, normally in the evenings and never with any profession of faith or anything. Why do you get involved? Why are you invested? One of our interns told me that this wouldn't fly in many churches, that many churches would be on my case about um, uh, the time that I was spending with people outside the church in the community. That somewhat disturbed me and troubled me, and then it, it, it started had, having me reach into my insecurities, wondering if anyone was silently judging. Um, and, and, and I went back to this passage of Scripture And I remembered that this is a core part of the overseer's task. 
and ministry. Not only that, though, I'm able to, to go before we even get to this, this well thought of by outsiders business. Um, I, uh, I remember what Jesus said. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. And we, we start going into the teachings of Christ and the apostles. We, we don't even have to get into the New Testament, frankly. Jesus is quoting the Old Testament. These are principles that are throughout all of Scripture that we are to care for those around us. Sometimes the emphasis is misunderstood. The passage of Scripture that says we are to care for people, um, um, especially those of the household of faith, that's not only those who are of the household of faith. That's especially those of the household of faith. He's saying don't neglect the household of faith, but we ought to do good to all people. Starting with those closest to us, brothers and sisters, uh, so, so before we start looking out, let's see what we're doing within. But with that in place, there is a lost, dying, and hurting world that needs the love of Christ, that needs the love of Christians, that needs us to do good. And our motivation should not be, well, I want them to think well about me, our motivation should be, I want God to be glorified in my life. I want Jesus to shine in my life. I want the power of the Holy Spirit to be evident in the way I live and how I interact with people around me. Sometimes we can uh, look at our limitations and we can uh, reflect on the, the, the weakness that we have. And there are so many times in these scenarios over the years where I have felt very in over my head. Some of you will recall because you, you'd bring me coffee or you'd offer to, to, to pray, sometimes offer to, to help uh, stand in and preach. Times where I had been up through the night, Saturday night, early Saturday morning, um, waiting on an ambulance with my elderly neighbor um, and, and then straight into service Sunday morning. And, um, uh, you know, that, that can raise flags for some people of, well, why were you doing that? Because you were, why not do that? What's, who is supposed to do that? And there are some, you're not his pastor though. But, but I do things be, not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a Christian. There are some things that I do because I'm a Christian. And, and, and thus, all of us need to be pursuing the glory of God in the good of our neighbors. Yes, indeed, our outsider neighbors. In other words, we shouldn't be viewing them, though they are not a part of the family of God, yet we should not be viewing them as though they are outsiders, but as fellow members of creation made in the image and likeness of God in the hope that our Lord will save them by His grace and open opportunities for us to minister not only goodness to them, but good news to them. Why do you bother? Well, it really is because there's a need. Who else will do it? And I want God to be glorified in my life and in my ministry and in my relationships with the neighbors. I want any random person here today to be able to knock on the doors of Park Ridings and Alexandra Road and Hornsey Park Road and Malvern Road and at least meet someone who knows me. And though you wouldn't see them here, they're able to give a good report, a good reference for me. There's three groups of people that I want you to see from the text this morning. And really the first is outsiders. While our primary motivation for loving our neighbors and for doing unto them as, as we would want done unto us and so forth should not be what they think about us, nonetheless, the apostle says that should be the result of our life and ministry among them. He must be, must be well thought of by outsiders. There's a couple of things that you should, be, should see just from those words. First of all, outsiders will think about you. Outsiders will think about you. Your neighbors do think about you. 
what do they think about you? And you're saying, well, oh, you know, this is a passage for overseers, isn't it? This is not, this is not about me. But remember, there's only one thing here that actually is outside the realms of everyday Christian virtue, and that's the ability to teach. All of us should aspire to have the characteristics and qualities represented in this passage. So when your neighbor thinks about you, do they, they think about you as lazy, disinterested, inattentive, head down, just going about your own life as though there's nothing around you? That's some. Or perhaps they, 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 they see you as the life and soul of the party, but they don't like your party. Um, it's keeping them up at night. It, it, you're, you're loud and you're obnoxious and you're just unpleasant to be around because you're just always in this state of overdrive. I mean, what, what do your neighbors think about you? Just start there, next door. Are they hearing your fights, your arguments? Do, do, do they hear the way that you interact with your, your children? The way they talk back to you? These are, these are things that maybe, um, that shouldn't be your motivation for doing things right and righteously, but maybe if you pause to think about people around you, it might help you sort out some other areas of your life. I, I really don't want it to be, well, what will they think about us? Because I don't think that's a very good motive. But it's not, it's not necessarily a bad motive. I don't want to be a bad witness. They see me get into the car going to church on Sunday morning. They, they see me walking down the street to the bus stop with the Bible in my hand. And yet, the other days of the week, I'm sending a different message. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Outsiders will think about you. And we know what they think about some at least. Some have left quite the mark such that um, we, we can... We can be defensive and say, well, the media is, is opposed to, to Christ and to Christianity, so they're always going to be parodying us. But I know the type of people that they're parodying. You do as well. The, the, the rude, stuffy person, the obnoxious person, the, the, the complete hypocrite who's, who's all pure and lovely when they're gathered with the saints and they're promiscuous through the week. The, 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 these type things are indicative of other people's experiences and observations in a way that they've translated it to art in a way that makes out that this is representative of the whole, albeit unfairly, but it doesn't change the fact that those ideas have seeds that were sown in personal experience. The hypocrite Christian is probably the number one trope when it comes to how the world sees us. The outsiders will think about you. The text implies that. Thus he says, he must be well thought of by outsiders. The implication being they might not necessarily think well of you. So that's the, the second thing about outsiders. Outsiders will think about you, but they may not think well of you for any of the reasons that I've just mentioned. In fact, if you flip around the various um, points of Christian virtue that are addressed in this chapter, you will see that these are often reasons why someone might not think well of you. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. But they look at your life and they don't, they don't see any aspiration. They, they don't see any sort of nobility or aspiration for nobility or leadership of yourself, never mind others. An overseer must be above reproach, but, but your life is in reproach and you bring others into reproach. The husband of one wife, or as we discussed, a one woman man, a one woman kind of man, and, and they, they, they look and they say, well, this, this person seems to be a bit on the, the casual side with their relationships. They're not faithful, sober-minded, Self-controlled, respectable. If you are not those things, then what are you? And what do people think about you? Hospitable, able to 
To teach might be one that's, that's um, l- less uh, germane to Christian virtue, but I, I have argued that I think that we ought to be able to have conversations, instructive conversations, important conversations, meaningful engagement with people that although it might not be teaching as such, nonetheless communicates something very good and important. The scriptures say to season our speech with salt. How do, we, how, how do we relate? Are we violent or are we gentle? Are we quarrelsome or kind? Are, are we lovers of money? Do they think, oh, you're all about the money? It's all about this? Or are you generous and sacrificial? How do you manage your house? Is it with dignity? That you keep your children submissive? Or are people thinking about, wow, the little terrors and they are properly stirred up. The only one to rival them is the parents. We we hear the screaming. We hear the the aggressive way of conflict resolution, which doesn't resolve the conflict, but creates an atmosphere where such behavior often thrives. Are you puffed up with conceit? Do they think that, well, that is a very hoity-toity individual. Just the way they, they walk around. It's not that their head is up high. It's that they're, they're, they're full of themselves and their own press. Brothers and sisters, outsiders will think about you. Outsiders may not think well of you. Outsiders should think well of you. We want them to think well of you. I, I, let, let's, let's put away this sort of thing. I, I don't care what people think about me. Well, actually, God cares even what people think about you. So your, your perspective is not greater than God's. If God cares about what people think about you because of the way it reflects upon Him then you should care what people think about you. He must be well thought of by outsiders. Okay, that's outsiders. To recap, outsiders will think about you. Outsiders may not think well of you. You're not entitled to their well thinking. And outsiders should think well of you. They should. That's, That's what we desire. That's what we want because... Not you, but Him. The Lord is in you. The Lord is with you. And you represent Him. But let's keep going. There's not only something about outsiders here, there's something about overseers. Overseers. um, We should oversee our own walk before a watching world. This is what Paul is getting at when he's saying he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace. Watch where you're stepping. You might be about to step into something. You might might be about to trip up. I don't want you to fall, Paul is saying. And if he can say that about overseers, those who aspire to lead the church, certainly he can say that about each and every one of us. In fact, the Scriptures do talk about the dangers of falling, of stumbling, of tripping up. And there is great hope that the righteous even will fall seven times, but will get up again. Why? He raises us up. And we keep going. But we should, we, we, we should be overseeing our own walk in a way so that progressively we're not stumbling so much. Think, think about children when they're starting out, uh, figuring out all of the different things that they can do and, and can't do, should and, and shouldn't do. Um, they, they learn through uh, those trips, don't they? They learn through those times of stumbling. And all of us have been there in our own development. 
My uh, poor daughter this morning has a developing mark on her forehead um, after um, uh, um, uh, quite outside of my um, uh, knowledge of her abilities, uh, rolling over onto her, her stomach from the upper end of the bed, crawling all the way down to the, the bed, and then flipping over completely this morning. Whilst I had briefly left the room for less than one minute to um, uh, sync my uh, iPad notes with my laptop. And um, uh, she was rightly angry with me and upset. And um, uh, Uliana and I haven't talked, but there, there might be uh, some, some justified disappointment. Um, I've learned a lesson as a parent. And N- Natasha said something very, um, well, I mean, it's therapy and counseling, so it's very helpful for me. Um, you know, that, that, that's important. That's important for her to, to have those knocks, to have those, those falls. So with that, <laughs> with that in mind, I feel slightly okay about things. Here's the, here's the thing. That won't be the first time she falls. I hope, it, well, it isn't the first time she falls. I know that. It, it, it won't be the last time she falls. Hopefully, it will be under my watch. I've learned a lesson. I trust. But it won't be the last time she falls because... She's, she's going to start, instead of doing the, the sort of scoot crawl, army crawl, she's going to start you know, lifting her core. And it's going to cave and her, she's going to bump her nose on the ground. Or she's going to start toddling about and she's going to fall. And all of these things. So this is not about, uh, about guilt tripping those who fall. Those who stumble. We all stumble. We all fall in many ways. There is not a one of us who has not done something. In fact, the outsiders who are judging you could be judged for far worse. It's important. There are people who are out to, 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 to look for things and to get to us. I, I get it. But the hope is that as our little ones grow, they fall less and less. They stumble less. Okay, they go through an awkward stage maybe in their their teenage years where they're they're shooting up and uh, their balance is different and they're a bit clumsier maybe, but you don't want to be a um, clumsy adult always fumbling about, tripping over the place. There's something wrong. You might want to, you know, get that checked and get some work on that. So it is with the Christian life. We all stumble in many ways. The Bible says it. James, read James. We all stumble in many ways. But we should be stumbling less and less. Overseers need to watch our own walk. Yes, before God. Our life should be lived before God above anyone else. That should be implied. But also before a watching world. That is very keen to catch us out. So at that level, we should care what people think about us because it reflects on more than just us. It certainly at a minimum reflects on the faith that we profess and the church even to which we belong. I I was uh, somewhat distressed one afternoon walking through the alleyway when a man who has not to my knowledge darkened the doors of the church for a service, but for whom I had prayed and had shared the gospel with him a time or two in the community who was doing drugs, um, uh, sometimes utilizing the bin lid out front uh, for that purpose, um, uh, introduced me to uh, a dealer and said, this is my pastor. And this, this was the man that is the middle man between the dealer, actually, and, and the recipient. But uh, this, they were having an exchange in the alleyway. Oh, pastor, this is, you know, okay. <laughs> so, you know, some of the more upstanding members of the community weren't walking about. Um, and, you know, I was at pains to say, well, uh, you know, I'm glad you think about me that way, but uh, I don't know about that. I've prayed, I've, I've prayed for him, you know, and I've 
talk to him about the gospel. Have you heard the gospel? Do you know the good news of Jesus? Overseers, um, you know, that, that does make us nervous, I will say. It's one thing about ourselves, but another about the congregation and how people are conducting themselves in the week. Is it commending? Or if someone were to follow you on Sunday morning and land here, would they then be saying, well, I really need to have a word with you about um, using their language. You know, we're Baptists. We don't think that way. But about your parishioner, you know, that's, that's what they would say. In fact, some people do see people I, I look after who are not Christians and they misread the situation and they wonder, is this a part of the church? The Old Testament, Proverbs 3, 3 through 4 says, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. So there's something to be said for someone pursuing a life of steadfast love and faithfulness. You're not going to be needlessly offending your neighbors and outsiders. They're not going to have an overwhelming abundance of things to say against you. Jeremiah continues this theme when his people were in exile. And in fact, there was another prophet who arose and said that they should be seeking as quickly as possible to leave their exile, to get back to their homeland so that they could worship the Lord and rebuild the temple and the walls and all of that good stuff. And he's giving them a message of hope so that they can go back to the promised land. And Jeremiah basically says, forget the promised land. This is the land you're in now. This man's a false teacher filling you with with false hopes. You're going to be here for a while. You best settle in. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And friends, so many of us in this congregation are immigrants. Those of us who are not It expands further if we talk about being second generation. So we are the children of immigrants often, if not immediately immigrants ourselves. And there is a level at which we are made to not feel at home. Even if this is where people were born and raised. And you can live in a space of being in exile. You you think about home... But home is some other place that you might never really have been connected to. You think you might like it, but you know that that's a distant dream. This is where you're at, and yet you don't feel at home. The reality is, as Christians, we will never feel completely at home anywhere in this life, in that sense. God is calling us to invest in the place where He has put us. Where are you now? We, we do need to stop always looking to the next thing. And, and, and grow some roots where God has us so that we can grow and be strengthened. And so that as we grow and be strengthened, our branches spread out and bless others around us. This is a real challenge. It's not easy. I know that. And yet God has you here. And as long as He has you here, He has you here for a reason. And that reason is never anything less than to honor Him. And we honor Him by pursuing the welfare of those around us. Someone in the Old Testament who put this into practice is the prophet Daniel. He was so impactful on those around him, so effective in the seeking the welfare of people around him in a place of pagan exile that... The high officials and various nobles of the land were looking to find grounds for complaint against him. They wanted to spot him in some way disrupting the kingdom. A threat to public order, to to peace and stability and all of that. But we're told in Daniel chapter 6 they could find no ground for complaint or any fault, because he was faithful. And no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, 
we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of God. And therein is a very important qualification. If people have something against you, let it be because you love and serve the Lord. If their complaint is against you because you're faithful to the Scriptures, then praise God. But don't be justifying yourself falsely that they hate you because you're a Christian. Because sometimes I've heard that and I, I look into it and that's not at all what's going on. In the New Testament, Jesus says His followers are light to the world. So let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And that is applied in so many ways, but it, it can be applied to work in everyday life. Paul does that in 1 Thessalonians when he says that we should aspire to live quietly, to mind our own affairs, and to work with our hands as we um, have been instructed so that we may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. If we apply it more broadly to everyday life, especially to the things that we say and how we say it. In Colossians, Paul says, walk within wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. We need to be careful that we are not reacting, but responding. Reactions are often those impulse things that we, based on how we feel, we react. And it can be needlessly aggressive, disruptive, and might contribute to a bad witness. How should we answer each person? These are case-by-case -case scenarios. We have to have wisdom. The Scriptures say, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask. Because God will give it. Never mind the inter those verbal interactions that people have. Sometimes we react to things around us in, in uh, more uh, physical ways or other ways. So we're, we're told in Romans 12, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. These are just some areas in which we ought to be watching over our walk lest we fall into disgrace. But it's not only uh, that we sh uh, need to watch over our own walk before a watching world. We should, in our watching our walk, we should be careful not to overlook devilish traps. They are there. Paul mentions Satan or the devil five times in this letter. The work of ministry is spiritual warfare. There are dangers. And those dangers are, yes, there are the things that are from within. There are also the things that are from without. But we dare not dismiss the reality of the satanic in opposing us. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, there's two men who have made shipwreck of their faith and are damaging other people. And Paul says, I've handed them over to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme. And that's terrifying to be given over to, to that sort of thing. We're told even in this passage that we saw it recently, he must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Here we read that, that if we're not careful, watching our walk, attentive to outsiders and the life we live before them, we may fall into a snare of the devil. And in 1 Timothy 5.15, we read that some have already strayed after Satan. Now, uh, uh, what is a snare? Does anyone know? Caden, what's a snare? Help us out. Not sure? Okay. A trap, did you say? Other, other said trap. What did you say? Okay. Andy? Okay, something that blocks your path. A trap is the best one-word definition. Thanks, guys, for the assist. 
it's a, it's a particular type of trap that, that you would set normally for like a bird. And um, uh, it, it will, it's like a noose or a basket that falls on you or something like that. It just, you're walking, you take a, a misstep, and next thing you know, that, that noose has wrapped around your leg and has pulled you out and up. So watch your step. Watch how you go, because there's not only a watching world, there's a roaming devil. And he roams to and fro like a raging lion, seeking whom he may devour. His mission is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Be careful. Mind how you go. Watch out. Overseers. Those who aspire to be overseers, Christian brothers and sisters, all of this is applicable, is it not? To how we live. There is a world around us. We live before God. Our, our, our primary motivation must be what, what glorifies God, what honors God. But I'll tell you, what honors and glorifies God is nothing less than what brings good reputation among outsiders. These two things are not separate. If you're seeking inappropriately to curry favor with outsiders, that's a problem. If you're tripping over yourself, you can trip over yourself in trying to satisfy and appease all kinds of ungodly expectations that people might have of you. That's a different thing. But so far as depends upon your life before outsiders, let the only thing that have fault in you be you love and serve the Lord. And you're submitted to His Word. Sometimes when you submit to His Word, you find that outsiders like you. You do. You will. Sometimes when you submit to His Word, you find that they don't. And they say nasty things about you. That's fine. Let this be your guide. One final category that I want you to see this morning. We've looked at outsiders. We've looked at overseers. I, you know that we can't leave this place without seeing Christ. We want outsiders to see Christ in us. It's not so that they can hype us up. It's so that that we don't do anything to dishonor or defame the name of Christ among the nations. Do you want people to know Jesus? Do you want people to see Christ for who He is and what He's like? Then seek to be more like Him, friends. We want outsiders to think well of Christ in us. It's not just I want them to think well of me. I want them to think well of Christ in me. Because every time someone rolls their eyes and says, Christians, as though that's a negative thing, and then you look into it and it really is something negative that they're criticizing. That is dishonoring the name of Jesus. We want outsiders who think poorly of us to do so because of Christ in us. If they think poorly of us, we want it to be because they see Christ. If they see good in us, it's because of Christ. If they see bad in us, it's because of Christ. And that is why we live. And that is the one for whom we live and before whom we live. So this isn't, I'm going to live my life before outsiders hoping to please people, hoping to satisfy their every expectation, wish, and demand, bowing before their oppressive control. That's not what this is about. But what it is about is honoring Jesus and His kingship over us in the way we live. Not everyone will love us. In fact... Jesus Himself is very clear about this. In John 15, He says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated Me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Be very careful, brother and sister, that you do not make this into some sort of sinful self-justification for the time that you come under criticism justly so. I've, I've seen it done. Someone with an appallingly bad attitude and severe spiritual immaturity 
gets fairly criticized for that, and suddenly, well, the world hates me because it hated Christ. No. Yes, but no, not this time. That's all on you, chief. We, we need to be careful that we, we don't let this perpetuate bad behaviors in our life. There are genuine things that people might be able to say that we need to address. But there is also genuine hatred for Jesus and for the submission of our life to following Christ. So in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, Christ pronounces a blessing upon those who endure such things. And we haven't begun to experience this in our context. Don't, don't kid yourself. Don't, don't think that you've had it difficult. There are, spend some time with people who have and, and you'll feel different. We are immensely blessed and privileged and free. Tides are turning. We might not be as resilient as we think. But Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you. I think we're kind of in that stage now. We're entering into it at least. Reviling is is more verbal. And it does have a massive psychological impact on those who are at the receiving end. You might experience it in your friend groups, in your workplaces, or maybe you haven't because you know I've got to keep certain things down low. But if I were who I am in Christ, maybe as I ought to be, then the reviling would kick in. Sometimes it's played off as just banter. But after a while... mm, It really wasn't funny to start with, but the jokes keep rolling and you feel it and you just shut off that part of you. Blessed are you when others revile you. Blessed are you when they persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And we might say so in the end, they persecuted Jesus. There are many scriptures that demonstrate that we're not going to be loved and adored universally. The point here is that we are not giving outsiders ammunition. We are not walking in scandal, but we are walking in our Savior. 1 Peter 2, verse 12 says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. First Timothy is filled with counsel that for, for, for what that does and doesn't look like. And sadly in our world, not all such behaviors are regarded as scandalous in society. Yet God has revealed through His law and gospel what is unacceptable conduct and what is acceptable conduct. Christ is just. And those in Christ should do justice. But Paul says that the law is laid down not for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers. The law. And when you speak law, when you apply law, Watch, that's, that's often the point where people in our society will hate you because you touched on something. There was once a, a gathering I was talking to on a traveler site um, and uh, everyone in the room, it was just a, a, a large gathering filled this, this chalet and they were, um, they were talking about the unforgivable sin. And their, their understanding of unforgivable sin was completely wrong and um, uh, they were um, basically talking about whether someone having committed um, homosexual sin, whether they could ever be saved. Now, I went through the list. I went through the list, and they were everything on the list except that one thing. 
And that was the one thing that they were all latched on to. Like, this is the unforgivable sin, this is the unforgivable sin. And I'm like, oh, guys. And it's, I'm not saying that the whole room was like, this person was this, this person was this. But often in one individual, you would have everything else in the list. And when I started saying that, suddenly I become apparently pro-LGBTQ. And I'm like, guys, no. Look, they will hate you from every direction if you start applying the law. It's just the facts. We have to understand the world will hate us on many things. But guys, we don't rest in a place of law. We rest in the gospel. We don't, we, we, we don't just stay in law. We're not always oh, this, that, and the other. Every, every time we gather, tell me I'm wrong, we point people to Jesus. We call people to come home to the Father who's, who's watching from afar, who will run out to meet them. The gospel is that we were all kinds of crazy things and we have received mercy. Mercy is extended to the uttermost, to all who believe in Jesus. Paul's testimony is that he persecuted the church of God, that, that, that he did evil things and he was shown mercy and was brought into the family. I received mercy, he says, for this reason, that in me as the foremost of sinners... Jesus Christ might display His perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. So pursuing Christ's likeness shapes how we live. We should live prayerfully, peaceful and quietly, godly and dignified in every way, he says in chapter 2. We, men, we, he tells us that we should pray and worship um, in, in a way that points outsiders to Jesus. He says, worship and pray, lift up holy hands without anger and, and quarreling. We should be known for our devotion to the Lord, not our strife. Women, it speaks even to what the, the, the most personal areas of, of your life. Paul says it even addresses what you wear and when and where and why is... Sadly, the world we live in is very surface level, so it's important that you are sending the right message. One, he says, that professes godliness and good works. What do people see in us? Everything about us, we need to be curating and cultivating so that people see, I might not like them, but they're committed to godliness and good works. We, we, we should understand that behavior matters. It doesn't save, but it tells the world that we have been saved and it has practical impact, that salvation, on our life. We're in God's house and His house has rules. It's the church of the living God. It's the pillar and buttress of truth. Are we upholding the truth even in the way we live? Now, the bad news is that the sins of some people are conspicuous. Paul says in cha um, uh, chapter 5, verse 24, they're conspicuous. That is, they, they, they're, they're, everyone sees them. They know it goes before them to judgment. So the sins of others appear later. The good news, however, is that good works are the same way. Good works are conspicuous. And even those that are not cannot remain hidden. So devote yourself, brothers, sisters, to good works. Flee evil. And I'll say in conclusion, from chapter 6, all of us, overseers, aspiring overseers, and none of that at all alike, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you've made good confession. You're charged in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in His testimony before Pontius Pilate, remember an outsider, made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach. He's saying... Don't do anything that causes the Pontius Pilots of your life
to justly condemn you. If you are condemned, if you are crucified, let it be by a guilt-stricken man backed into a corner who says, I've washed my hands of the matter. He's really done nothing wrong. And commit to this until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which will be displayed at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, He who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to Him be honor and eternal dominion, not least in our conduct before outsiders. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask now that You would be merciful and gracious to work in us by Your Holy Spirit to apply all that this message means for us today in lives of godliness, lives of holiness, lives pursuing all that is pleasing to You. And Lord, if we should suffer, if we should suffer criticism or critique or, or worse, um, we, we pray that we would do so for Jesus Christ, not, not because of some momentary Christlessness in our behavior. We ask, Lord, that You would equip us and strengthen us. We confess that we stumble in many ways. We pray that as those who are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, You would pick us up, dust us off, keep us going. In Jesus' name, amen.